Bye. In the journey towards progress, every step counts. And today, we take a giant leap by amplifying the voices that have been whispered for too long. The voices of women, the architects of change. In the heart of our community, we bring together the architects, the leaders, the visionaries, the trailblazers. They don't just lead, they inspire. They don't just talk, they ignite conversations that transform. This is more than a gathering, it's a movement. A movement where women lift each other higher, where ideas aren't just heard, but celebrated. Because in our stories, there is power. In our experiences, there's resilience. In our conversations, there's revolution. And in our unity, there's a force that moves mountains. Join us as we redefine leadership, reshape the narrative, and illuminate the path for every woman stepping into greatness. Together we rise, together we lead. Welcome to a world where women's voices don't just echo, they resonate. Welcome to Power to Our Women. All right. Uh, welcome to Power to Our Women Conversations. Thank you so much for coming. We are so, so, so glad to have you on board. Uh, feel free to text us in the chat box. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Today, we are joined by a really, really special guest. I'm going to introduce her, and then we'll get to have our Q&A, which is going to be so interactive and fun. So Jonah Moore is a Filipina, Canadian, American technology leader with over 20 years of experience. She brings products to life for Fortune 500 companies of this world. She's worked with some uh, interesting companies such as Frog Design and Razorfish. And as a CTO at MetaLab, Jonah is working to push forward both in the industry and the practice. She helps some of the world's top companies design and build and ship digital products. Her past clients include Slack, Coinbase, Mid Journey, and most recently, Tally Health. In her initial year at MetaLab, Jonah has helped the company double the number of new builds to market. Her team is working to write a new playbook on launching impactful products from zero to one. Welcome, Jonah, to this insightful chat. Thank you so much for having me. I am so honored. It, it's wonderful. I mean, we're so excited to have you. And I, I've kind of introduced you, but I think it would be so nice to hear from you. I mean, who is Jonna Moore? What is MetaLab? What do you guys do? Just to give the audience a bit of context. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as, as you said, I am a Chief Technology Officer at MetaLab. I lead engineering here and helping ship our products to market. Uh, I am based out of Seattle, but MetaLab itself is a global product design agency where we help many clients design, build, and launch uh, products to market. That includes apps or platforms for many of the Fortune 500, but we've also been fortunate to do many, many startups. So you've probably used uh, one of the apps uh, or products that we've made, Slack, Uber, TripAdvisor, uh, Upwork, Row, we don't work for Google, and, and many, many more. Okay, so I mean, I've definitely used Uber, Slack, and I think Coinbase to some degree. So uh, you're a CTO, right? And I'm thinking there's a lot of women in the audience today and they're thinking um, in tech and I want to level up in my career. So maybe talk about your career journey and how you walk from, uh, I think you started working in 1997. So mm -hmm. how do you walk from that place to becoming a CTO? Yeah, well, I think it's just a little bit about me. Uh, my parents uh, immigrated to Canada from the Philippines uh, many years ago. I'm not going to say how many years ago, but uh, so I grew up in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I, my mother's a nurse and I come from a family of nurses. Uh, my parents thought uh, or, or hoped that I would be a doctor. That was just the thing. Uh, they really wanted me to, to be a doctor. However, whenever I saw blood, I would pass out. And so we knew that healthcare was not for me but my parents knew that I had a passion for learning. So uh, my dad worked in a hospital and he saw someone uh, working on 
computers. So we asked him, like, what do you do? Uh, how did you get your career? He also, I can't believe him, he asked this, uh, how much money you make? And so uh, when he found out that computers was quite an interesting job and that it could pay well, uh, he wanted to see if that could be a career area for me. So uh, when I was 10 years old, he bought a, 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 sorry, a used computer and uh, brought it home and I started to play with it. I read all the manuals and I started to learn how to program. I made games and I had so much fun and I was always on the computer. And so from there, I volunteered uh, teaching you know, computer classes at school. I uh, went into, you know, I went into computer science, uh, went to school uh, there. And then uh, from there, I uh, got my first job doing, uh, at first I was doing QA and then I got to do some uh, programming. Uh, and then I moved from Canada to the US. I moved to Seattle uh, from Vancouver and uh, it was very, very scary. I will say that because I was, you know, I was moving to a new country and I had to get a visa and everything, uh, but I got a job uh, doing some consulting, getting to make some um, great programs. I got to do some work for Microsoft. And then uh, from there, I actually ended up uh, deciding I wanted to see the rest of the US. So I moved to Austin, Texas, where I worked for Razorfish at first, and I got to work on some of the largest uh, digital brands and companies. Uh, and it was such a great experience. Uh, and then from there, I went to Frog Design, where I really learned about human-centered design and how you can make uh, great products by understanding what the user wants. And I got to work for you know companies like uh, Marriott and Progressive and so many more. And then two years ago, I was trying to figure out what is what was my next move. And I uh, had heard about MetaLab because MetaLab started in Canada. And I'm already in the US. I've been working in the US for about probably uh, you know 18 plus years. And they approached me asking me if I was interested in their CTO position. And because I was like wanted to uh, really support you know Canadian companies, I, I did my interview with them and I really fell in love with the people and decided to uh, take on engineering here because the work and clients, you know, as I mentioned, were really exciting. And I really wanted to work with some of the best startups in the world. So that was sort of my career journey. I mean, I think your career journey is really interesting. I mean, just cause you've worked in some really big organizations, right? So I want to assume right off the bat, I want to say like, I think you're really, really good at what you do, right? And some of your achievements have even included winning awards for innovation. So what would you say contributed to the success? Is it just uh, your level of skill or how did you find yourself in this multiple really successful organizations? Um, well, thank you. Uh I think that a lot of it was I was always willing to learn. Uh, I knew that, uh, you know, these companies had really smart, really talented people. And I went in there just trying to learn and absorb as much from all of them. And uh, I really love working in a team environment. And it was, you know, these aren't my personal successes. These are the successes of my team and, and us working together. So I think of it was, you know, I love working with designers who really have great, big, wonderful ideas. I love working with technologists to really push the technology. And a lot of it was always challenging yourself to figure out, you know, how I could do more. You know, are, are we making the best product out there and thinking about the end user? So at the end of the day, it's really thinking about who are you making this thing for? And is it going to change your life in a positive way? And that's when you do something well is when you actually change something for the better instead of just it about being about programming or being about the tech it's about the person that you're making the solution for oh wow that's really insightful so i kind of want to double down into something you've talked about so you said uh working at um Razor Fish and all those big companies, you're obviously meeting people who are Ivy League. And I think you've talked about this before in previous conversations that you've had about the value of basically getting talent or you don't have to have gone to the best schools to be really good at what you're doing. So could you maybe talk about a bit about that and how you've used that to basically just hire people outside of the Ivy League schools? 
Yeah, you know, you know, as I mentioned, I came from a family of immigrants. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. I actually had to get scholarships. Uh, I went to a BCIT. It's a school in in Canada. Uh, it was a great, you know, program, but I, you know, it's not an Ivy League, you know, top school. And you know, and I just wanted a chance when I was starting. I just wanted, you know, the ability to really um, prove myself. And you know, when I look at talent. I remember myself in that situation, not not going to like, you know, Harvard or going to an MIT or going to the best school. It was just someone who wanted a chance and somebody who needed someone to believe in them. And so some of the best people that I have ever worked with in my career don't have degrees. They're some of the most talented designers and engineers. Uh, some of them, you know, went to community college and, you know, did it themselves. And it's great. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to a, a top yeah. school. But I believe it always comes down to the individual. Uh, I remember there was uh, one guy that I interviewed back, actually back when I was at Razorfish, and he had barely an experience. He just took a coding boot camp. But he said to me, he's like, I just want a chance. Just give me a chance. And it was for an internship. And I was like, OK, well, this guy seems to really be passionate. And we gave him a chance. Um, and after six months, we hired him full time. And, uh, you know, he was great. And now he's one of the uh, he's a phenomenal architect and technology leader out there. So and I have so many more stories of that. It's just giving people a chance. And I believe that if people are driven and have a passion, you know, they'll, they'll succeed. OK, so I mean, I think uh, from the audience, I would definitely love to hear if you're in this audience and you've been in a place where you've been given a chance by someone and that has really propelled you in your career, I think we would love to hear some of those stories and i just want to move us into um, a more products or other business oriented side of those questions so you have written about how products can survive and thrive despite volatile market uh, market conditions right so what do you think is the key to building resilient and adaptable products that resonate with people's target audiences yeah i think number one it's talking to uh the user that you're designing it for and understanding their needs, understanding what are their pain points, understanding, uh, you know, what, what is something that is going to have a really, you know, positive impact in their day to day or whatever you are designing for. So talking to those users, listening to them, but also thinking about the market trends, like, you know, we've seen just in the last few years, how quickly technology changes. And so it's understanding too, like balancing what, does the user need with also what are the technology and or what are the economic situ you know uh, trends and thinking about you know designing products that can last in those markets you know if if we see that AI for example is going to you know maybe create redundancy in some jobs you're not going to make a solution that is going to go against that so it's understanding all these different influences and making sure you have an an unbiased lens like really sometimes our biases are the things that can hold us back. I think it's going into it open-minded, you know, thinking about and listening to all the different solutions, brainstorming, and then working out what is the best thing for the challenge and the opportunity at hand and kind of putting your perception to it, to the side. All right, uh, that's really insightful. So I kind of want to talk about MetaLab and some of the companies that you've worked with, right? So you've worked with Slack, Coinbase, TripAdvisor, Uber. I feel like these are companies that we probably interact with and use every day. And I would love for you to share with us a specific project that you feel you're really proud of and that you made really successful. But I mean, all these companies are successful, but if you were to pick out one, that you feel was very exciting to work on, which one? Oh, this is hard. This is like choosing like one of your, you know, naming one of your children's as one of your, as one of your favorites. Because I, I mean, I've loved so many, so many uh, different things that we've gotten to work on. I'm just going to talk about more recent things because um, there's one of the ones I'm most proud of in my career, and it was very, very, very early. Uh, when I was first starting was I worked on the first electronic filing system in the nation um, back in Washington, back in Seattle, so that all the court cases could be uh, could be digitized. And I, that was actually one that I won an innovation award for. Uh, and so I'm super proud of that work because it helped get uh, people, um, you know, restraining orders and people, you know, getting through court cases and getting the, the help that they needed very quickly. I'm super proud of that work. 
But I'd say more recently, uh, Metalab right now, we have the opportunity, we're working with one of the leading nations, um, children's health research firms that is doing work in the mental health space. And as a mother, I'm so, that is something, I'm really worried about children's mental health, especially with everything related to digital. So we're working on some solutions with them. And it's just, it's so rewarding to think about how can you use technology for good. Uh, one of the other ones that one of our teams is working on is for The Atlantic, um, the magazine. They are actually exploring ethical AI. And so we actually built their AI sandbox uh, and proof of concept to help figure out um, so people could create experiments uh, in this space. So it's really something around mental health and, um, and then also something in the AI space doing something for good. So it's been great. All right. Um, so I kind of want to pivot into career and I kind of feel like a lot of people in the audience would be really interested in this question, right? So this is about deciding our next steps in our careers. So you you wrote an article about this, I think a while back, and you talked about the importance of seizing opportunities. And I want to believe this is one of the things that has led you to get to where you're at right now. So how have you embraced opportunities throughout your career journey, but also how can someone who's in the audience today discern and know this is the opportunity for me, or is it just that when we're young, we should kind of like say yes to all the opportunities that are coming our way? Yeah, man, this is tough. You know, I would, a lot of my friends would say, my family say I'm a little bit of a risk taker. You know, when I first uh, was deciding to move from Canada to the U.S., it was scary. I was going by myself. You know, I was in my early 20s and I didn't know I didn't have any family or friends when I was moving to Seattle for my um, for the job down here. And I remember I had some people saying like, oh, I shouldn't go because I don't know anyone. It's going to be scary. You know, you're going to be alone. And I, and I will say it was scary and I was alone. There are, there are times that I will say that I did cry when I was, you know, by myself because I was so far away from my family. Um, it, it wasn't that far, but it was still far enough away, a country away. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just believed like, okay, it's worth it. Like, why not? Like, what do you have to lose by trying? you know, by actually trying to see if you can make a better life for yourself and exploring. I'm, a, I'm one of those people that's like, I, I want, I don't always want to look back and be like, and regret, you know, even when I was moving from Seattle to, uh, to Austin, you know, I didn't know anybody in Austin and it was, you know, taking a risk again about, you know, moving to Texas of all places. And, um, you know, and when I got there, I got a job, got my job at Razorfish. It was, um, in 2008 and the market had just you know had just crashed we had the depression and everybody was just saying or the recession everybody said just come home just come home it'll be better if you're with your family but you know i had a job and i knew it was really hard and what i did was i just worked harder you know i worked a lot at that time you know i was young and it was like instead of going out all the time i, I just worked a lot and i learned a lot i was always reading i was always you know um, trying to meet lots of people. And uh, it really opened my eyes. And I ended up meeting my husband or my partner in, um, in Austin, and then uh, ended up staying there for several years and came back to Seattle so I could be closer to my family. But, you know, there are a lot of times where even in work, there were times I'm like, oh, should I take this job? Should I quit a job where I've been at something for so long? Or should I learn this new technology? And a lot of times it's things move so quickly and things change. You can never predict your future. So it's just, you know, try. There's nothing, there's no harm in trying unless you're leaving something that is ridiculously very, very good. But, you know, there's no, there's no harm trying in and seeing like if you can do something better uh, for your life or for your family, so. Oh, wow. So, I mean, I think that resonates with a lot of us especially uh, for young people who are kind of just navigating their career. And uh, I want to uh, talk about inclusivity, which was our main topic for today's conversation. So I would love to hear from you. How do you define inclusivity? And in your position as a CTO at Coinbase and even all the other places that you've had the privilege of um, leading teams and people at, how have you used any strategies to challenge the stereotypes that exist around the subject and promote inclusivity. Yeah, um, 
you know, through my career, I, I would say it, it, it wasn't totally easy. Many times I was the only, you know, woman developer in the room. Sometimes I was the only uh, non, non-white person, I would say, in the room. And it was, you know, it, at times it's intimidating and it's hard. But a lot of times for me, I try to put out some of that to the side and just try to figure out how can I make friends with these people? How can I relate to people? And a lot of times it's about creating empathy and listening to other people's points of view. When you open up and and you uh, allow yourself to understand other people's points of view, they're more likely to listen to your point of view and to talk to you. And, you know, some of my friends are um, some great technologists who I, you know, in the beginning, you would never think that we'd be friends, but, you know, they're some of my closest, you know, colleagues uh, today. And a lot of it is about sometimes putting your biases to the side, and this is for everybody, and making sure that you um, understand people, you like listen to their point of view. And then also, if you feel like someone isn't getting listened to, like there are times I'm, I'm in a meeting, and I'll hear somebody over talk somebody else who might be more introverted or shy, you, you go out of your way to ask like person like, oh, what's your point of view? Like, or what do you think? Um, so that they can feel heard and they can feel supported. So many times, every it's about people trying to have the loudest voice in the room. And many times it's about, it's not the loudest voice. Sometimes it's maybe the quietest voice can have the, you know, the best idea or the greatest, you know, solution. Um, in terms of inclusivity, I believe it's just number one is giving everyone a chance, making sure that everyone feels like they can be part of the conversation, that they're included that they feel uh, important, that they feel um, supported. I think that uh, so many times uh, people just, we don't listen to each other. And that's why the world I think is going through so much, so many hard things is just we, we don't care to, you know, care about others, so. I mean, I really like what you said about empathy. So basically, a lot of times you can walk into a room and you're scared that other people are not listening to you or like you're the only person in there. But it's also really important to think about that point of view. I also really liked what you said about standing up for people who seem to have a difficult time navigating conversations in a group setting. So I kind of want to talk about um, gender equality. So you're a tech person, right? So essentially, how do you see technology helping to promote gender equality and inclusion in the workplace? And what steps do you think um, individuals, so anyone on this call or organizations should take to use technology as a tool to promote inclusion? Yeah, I think um, there is so much work that has to be done. There needs to be more women in technology. I think uh, that uh, I know, you know, there, we see a lot of great movement towards it, but it's hard. Like it is, it is, it is something that I think is going to take everyone's uh, support and work into getting into. I do believe there's a big cultural uh, part of it too. You know, I do see in, you know, U.S. and Canada, it might be a little bit more accepted to have women in technology. And, you know, when I work, you know, we're a global company, I've been finding it hard to recruit uh uh, women in technology from other countries. I don't know if it's just because it's just not something that has been promoted. Uh, but I think number one is creating um, the opportunities and the spaces for people to, to do so, whether it's more, you know, uh, classes, boot camps, scholarships, you know, you need, we need to create space and ways for people to get, uh, to get women into technology in general. So they find a passion. I think number two, it's supporting groups, uh, when uh, at a young age, you know, it, it is actually making sure that um, women feel like being in technology is a great job. Being a, you know, going into tech is cool. It is not, you know, you hear that people, you know, I cannot stand how everybody says you should become an, you could become an influencer, and that's the way to go. I, I think it's actually supporting women and understanding that, you know, science and technology is, is a great direction in their career and supporting it and making sure that you're a positive role model for others. I think it's about giving back. Uh, to the to the younger generation, so that they feel like it's normal for them to to be in this space. Um, I think uh, number two is mentoring is a huge bit. I so many times I'll go to conferences or even have women reach out to me who ask me how to deal with certain situations where they don't feel comfortable. And I do think it's about supporting women. It's it's a tough journey. It's hard when you're one of the only women in the room. 
And so, you know, I, I believe in, you know, creating community, supporting people, uh, yeah, you know, as they are going through struggles or sometimes people say like, hey, I've had this problem. Can you help me figure out how to handle it or how to talk to my boss or how to deal with this person who always makes me feel you know, horrible about myself? It's you know, creating space so that you, you, know, you are um, supporting people because people will push through if they feel like they have you know, that support. And so us as women, you know, we need to create, I, I would say, that space for each other, but also allies. You know, the reason why I am here where I am today is I've had phenomenal male allies who have supported my career, who have uh, propped me up to others, who have, you know, spent their extra time in, in supporting me. And I am so thankful to, uh, you know, all of them because I wouldn't be where I am without them uh, today. And so it's, you know, making sure allies, whether it's our, our, you know, our male colleagues are supporting women as well and making sure that they're getting that voice. Uh, um, and then I'm just trying to think like, but I, you know, in terms of um, the hiring process, uh, you know, as women, uh, you know, as technology leaders, we just changed our entire uh, hiring process. So we make our coding tests for uh, our candidates. Uh, we don't even know their name. We don't know their gender. They just have to complete a coding test. We go through it because we want to make sure our panels aren't biased when they are looking at the, the coding tests. And then if somebody, you know, uh, you know, when somebody passes, then, you know, we learn more about them when you actually go through the interview process, but we try not to know anything about that person. So it's fair, you know, as people getting it, getting in. So it's looking at your hiring processes as technology leaders and making sure that they are uh, fair, that you have a, you know, a panel that has um, multiple genders, multiple, you know, ethnicities and groups that are supporting. Uh, and then it's also making sure as we are in our careers that there's a growth plan. And that they're, you know, we're doing performance and that we are measuring people fairly. It's not just based off of, oh, so-and-so is so nice. It is based off of people are putting the work. They should be able to move up. And it's making sure that uh, we create uh, growth plans uh, for people to grow throughout their career. Thank you so much for that, Jonah. So um, I love a few things that you've said and I kind of feel the common denominator for all these things is technology, right? So right now it's really easy for a five-year-old to think that she could be a space engineer because she'll see social media pages and other women who are doing this thing talking about it. And at the same time, removing bias from processes like hiring tech really enables that to happen. So I kind of want to get more specific about challenges that face women in the workplace and I mean, from your perspective, what do you think are the biggest challenges that women are facing in the workplace today? And I would also love to hear the responses about this from the audience, just because I understand we're kind of in different demographics. But from your perspective and where you're sitting at today, what are the biggest challenges that you've seen women face? And how have you seen these challenges be handled the best way? Yeah, you know, I remember there were times uh, early in my career where, you know, I felt like I wasn't being heard or I felt like I would say something and no one would listen to me. And then someone, a male colleague would say the almost exact same thing as me and then they would get credit for it. And I remember there's this moment where I ran into the bathroom almost crying because this one of my colleagues was getting taking credit. And I was like, OK, I don't let them see you cry, you know, uh, and I remember, like, I'm just going to work hard and I'm going to prove it. But it was also then, you know, I started talking to others about, like, how can I get my voice more heard? Like, what am I saying? And some of the things is, uh, and I and I know I've been, you know, I've kind of gone through this. Sorry, my, my cat is trying to eat my plant. So, um, uh, the, sorry, I have a cat right here and it's like eating my plant right beside me. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I would say that um, it is about making sure that um, the way that you speak, that you are, that you believe in yourself, that you're confident. You know, a lot, a lot of my colleagues would say to me is you seem so unsure about yourself and you seem like, you know, you're scared to have a point of view and a talk. And I remember when somebody said that to me, I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I'm always letting someone go before me. I'm always, you know, I think, and I think it was a little bit of a cultural thing. Like in my culture, you know, you, you don't want to claim credit credit for things. You don't want to be the first person to talk. You let somebody else talk first. 
And I had to sometimes, I had to actually change a lot of the cultural things that I grew up with to making sure that I, I had a voice for myself, that I was confident, that I came in with a strong point of view, that I was direct. Della, stop. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, um, that I had a, a strong point of view and that I was, um, I was making sure that people like believed in my voice. Sometimes people want to know that you are confident in your ideas and in your, you know, solutions. And when I would see other colleagues, not even just women, other colleagues where they would try to advocate for themselves, but I could see them, they would get a little um, nervous and they wouldn't, you know, you know, um, be confident, I'd be like, oh, explain more or, or let's, you know, why don't we, you know, let this person talk and let's hear their point of view. Cause I think sometimes too, it's like people will just defer to the most confident person in the room or they'll, uh, you know, always want to go to the loudest person. And, uh, and that can be a thing, you know, you know, as you're trying to move up in their careers, people don't hear your voice because you're so nervous and scared to do it. So um, I think number one is advocate for others who might their voice might be hindered by like their colleagues. And then um, number two is making sure that you are, uh, that you are direct, that you are giving uh, your point of view and it's clearly your point of view and that you have a voice, create a voice for yourself in the room. Um, and I think that is a, uh, you know, super important. And I think the other things is, you know, take credit for your work. There are a lot of times, sometimes you, you hope somebody will notice and they're not taking credit for what they do and they, they should you know take credit for what they do so i mean i think it's interesting that we're talking about this because uh i just saw um there was a reel on instagram and they're basically talking about how a lot of women have a problem with making themselves visible right so owning the work that they're doing being confident in the ideas that they're presenting and i like what you said people will defer to the most confident person in the room. So you, you've got to consciously just work towards being comfortable with your ideas and expressing them and comfortable with other people listening to you and voicing out your ideas. I really, really love that. So um, um, just give a little piece of advice on that. I had to take a lot of facilitation classes, like classes that actually taught you how to you know, public speak, how to facilitate, how to uh, command a room, like a lot of leadership, you know, courses, there's a billion things online you, you can do today. We didn't have that when I was growing up through my career, but I think it's important for to take some of those classes so that you can understand how to present yourself in a way. And you know, it comes with time and practice. It doesn't just come uh, naturally to a lot of people. You really have to work on it. All right. Thank you so much for that, Jonah. So um, for the audience, I would really, really love to see some responses in the chat about that question. What are some problems that you're facing as a woman in your career? And I think Jonah would be more than happy to kind of talk about that. So um, I want to talk about um, you again. So could you share with us some pivotal moments in your career journey that have shaped your approach to championing inclusion in the workplace? Um, and I think, uh, particularly from the perspective of being in a, a career space where sometimes you've said you found yourself as the only woman in the room. And on top of that, also, you're a minority woman in the tech industry. So what are some of the defining career moments that you've gone through? And how have you navigated some of like the biggest hurdles that you faced? Yeah. Well, oh, that's a that's a that's a interesting you know question. I, I I I don't think that there's a bunch of pivotal moments. I would say it was just a, a bunch of moments. You know, I would say you know there was you know one moment where I felt like I had a a male colleague that was just so difficult to work with, and that was uh, I don't know. Always felt like I was you know um, being put down you know by that person. And, you know, I actually, you know, sought help, you know, from a couple of my mentors asking how to deal with this person, how to, you know, make sure that I can figure out, you know, because the, the person sometimes would just say things that were, I would just feel, I would feel dumb, you know, they would just make me feel uh, like I was insignificant. And so one of the times I just decided to, to and I don't say that you have the, it depends on the situation, but I actually went up to that person. It's like, 
hey, you know, sometimes when we're in these meetings, I just, I'm trying to figure out how I can get my point of view across. You know, do you have, you know, give me ideas or, you know, like I just went to them with the, the problem, not pointing out that they were the cause, but just saying like, I'm, you know, when we're in meetings, sometimes I'm, I'm struggling to get my, my point of view across or people aren't listening to my ideas. Do you have any advice for me? Do you have any ideas? And that person was like, oh yeah, I got advice. Like, course he was saying that and you know he actually stood up for me once after that and i think it was because i didn't attack him and say like oh you're the problem i went and asked like for help in that solution it's a little bit of psychology there but um for me you know that was when i realized um and that i'd say that's a micro moment because then i realized is like if you actually go to some of these people and try to create a relationship with some of them you can actually maybe get through some difficult, difficult times. And so many times now in my career, when I find that I'm facing a challenge, instead of running away from it, I'll go and like, you know, just be like, see if I can have a conversation with a person like, hey, I'm feeling like this or hey, like, you know, I would love your ideas or thoughts on how I can get through this. Or, you know, it's OK to ask, you know, asking for help doesn't show weakness. I think asking for help shows that shows that you care and shows that you are also willing to listen to that person's point of view. And that can sometimes help you, you know, navigate through some microaggressions or some tough situations at work. Um, and there are many times like, don't go in assuming that you know all the answers. Like you're, there's gonna be times where you're gonna have to learn. I, there's so many times where I've asked me like, hey, can you teach me how to do this? Or can you explain this to me? I didn't understand it. And I'd really like to understand it. And you spend the time with them. And then also I would spend you know, the time in my evenings and weekends trying to figure out how to get through some sort of technical challenge or some sort of problem. So I think a lot of times it's, it's being open into learning and then also building those you know, relationships around you. All right. So I love that you're talking about building relationships. And I think uh, during the course of this conversation, you've kind of talked about um, mentorship and how important it is as a, as a lady or as a woman in the workplace to have people who are rooting for you. So this could be female or male allies. Um, but um, kind of just like walk us through your experience with some of the best mentors you've had. How did you come to nurture those relationships into situations where they're actually now standing up for you and even like championing for you, teaching you things? Yeah, you know, I um, there were so many times where I would just, um, I remember I had this one, I'm just gonna name him Rich Smith. Uh, I know he's well retired, but uh, you know, this was probably about, you know, 20 something years ago. But I remember it just, I was so, I admired the way that he would speak with clients. And I remember I admired the way that um, he navigated through things. So I would ask him like, I would love to learn how you do, you know, how you talk to clients and how you get through some difficult challenges. Can you explain to me like what are some tips and tricks and some ways or if you could help me work on that myself? And then he took me under his wing and he was always advocating for me and always giving me advice. And he, you know, say like, hey, in this meeting, I noticed X, Y and Z. I think that you should try to do this instead. Or, you know, if I had a tough situation, he would, you know, I'd go, you know, and, and ask him, you know, how would you handle this? Uh, and there's so many more people that I did that. But I think it's important that not only do you, um, you know, you go seek out those people, but you take the time to do that for others. And you don't have to be like a CTO and a, or a great tech leader with someone more junior. It can just be a colleague. It's like someone to like, hey, help me walk through the scenario. Let's talk. Like I do this daily. Like I will call up, you know, some of my colleagues and I'll be like, help me figure out how to navigate the solution. And we just walk through it and we, you know, talk through it and talk through pros and cons. And it would just help me become more confident later when I would go into that situation. So many times feel you feel like you're just kind of, you don't know how you're being perceived by others. And I think it's just getting advice from your friends or even like, it doesn't even have to be someone directly in your field. It can be other people. Cause a lot of the times, it, it, there's the technical portion and the craft, but there's also just na people navigating people and dynamics is, you know, is hard. So, and getting advice on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I can definitely resonate with that. There's a lot of times in a work situation where you kind of feel like you felt some type of way about something, but then in real sense, everyone else is just like, what? We 
no, we didn't notice that. So sometimes yeah. you kind of just need people giving you feedback around you and telling you what it was and what it wasn't. Okay, so and to get a bit personal, so what is the most unexpected skill or hobby that you have outside of your professional life? Um, I love sports. I will uh, say that um, I'm a big racket sport kind of person. So I play tennis. Uh, I played pretty competitively, I would say, for a little period, uh, at captain a team. Uh, and then, you know, just playing tennis, you have to play all the time. You know, now that I'm a parent, I don't have as much time. So started getting into pickleball. I don't know if you know what pickleball is. It's big in uh, the U.S., but it's, it's kind of like the mix of ping pong and tennis. Um, and so I've kind of got into that and it's a good sort of uh, stress relief. But um, yeah, I, I love racket sports. And then the other thing is I love travel planning. I love like researching countries and researching places and going on trips. And I plan out the itineraries out for, you know, my family and I'll be like, OK, we're going to go to, you know, we're going to go to the Zion National Park. And these are the thing, you know, I just love um, doing all that. It's it's a fun little hobby. OK, um, I mean, I don't know what the other people from Nairobi think, but I, I haven't heard about pickleball before. This is my first time. Um, another question is, how have you balanced your role as a mom with your uh, executive responsibilities at MetaLab? And what advice would you give to other working moms in uh, similar positions? Oh, this one has been hard. I'm still, I will say I'm still growing and learning in this. Uh, when my son was quite young, it was really, really hard. And I'm sure other moms can account. Like when he was a baby and had to go back to work, I remember just um, sitting in my car after I dropped him off at daycare crying because I was just like, am I being a bad mom? Am I, you know, it, it was just so, you know, hard uh, to go back to work. And uh, and then, you know, you want to be 100 percent at work and you want to be 100 percent at being um, a mom and I'm going to tell you there's no such thing you you basically need to like um uh you basically sorry my cat is going crazy in this interview for some <laughs> she's like she's like uh I don't know if you can see her right there so yeah, uh, she's, she's uh trying to open the door um uh I will say that and now my dog is going after her um I I, I will say um that um I'm sorry, I kind of lost my job. The being a mom, so you're trying to balance a, a bunch of billion things. It's like you can't expect there, you, there's no such thing as being a perfect anything. And that if you try to aim to be able to be everywhere at once, you're just going to break down. And it's, it's hard. Like being a mom is a full time job and you also have a full time job. Something has to give sometimes. And number one, I had to go to my husband or my partner and say, I can't do this all. I need your help. Like I, I like I feel like I'm struggling and, and telling them that I struggle. So we would divide up the work. We would get our parents to come help us. So my mom would come uh, some days so that we, you know, I could get a break. Uh, and then there were some things that we gave up. Like I didn't, I don't play tennis, you know, anymore. But I'm gonna say, don't give up things that keep you healthy. So I still try to make sure that I have time to go for, even if it's to go walk the dog. Or it's, you know, make sure I get some meditation in or it is just making some time or read a book. It's time to it's good to make time for yourself because you'll be a better parent if you feel, you know, de-stressed. Yeah. Um, but I just think that uh, it's going to it's, 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 ju it's just a daily struggle, I think, for not just moms, but I would say for parents in general in terms of you know managing kids and managing a job and. I think go in knowing it's tough. And also if you see somebody uh, like any of your colleagues are struggling, go and, you know, see if like, if you can help out. Um, many times or if your friends are struggling, there are times where I go to my friend when I see she's frazzled and I say like, Hey, why don't I take your kids and my kids and you can go and take some time for yourself and I'll, you know, take the kids up to the park. So I think it's, you know, the community aspect as well as supporting each other as a community. All right. So, um, I mean, I'm kind of getting a running theme here. So this theme is get people who are your cheerleaders, get people who are like your community around you, who help you out with things. Uh, if you're having a problem with someone, instead of going all berserk, kind of just try to approach it in a smart way, get some ideas from them about how you can solve that problem. I'm learning so much during this session. And I kind of want to edge into something else. Um, what is your definition of success 
So basically, how does John Amore define being successful? And how would you want to be remembered? Uh, um, you know, I when I was younger, I used to be like, oh, I want to be one of those executives who do it all. And, you know, you, you see that, you know, have a name for yourself. I don't think that for me is success anymore. I, I think for me, success is, you know, having a wonderful family that, you know, I have a loving child and a loving spouse and a loving family. Um, and I have great friends. For me, you know, that's a great success and being able to provide a life uh, that is comfortable where we are, you know, we get to go do things that, the, what, you know, what we want to do. I think success is also for me now where I am in my career is seeing others around me uh, succeed and see uh, happy. You know, I had a, a good friend who uh, we used to, we started out as colleagues and she was struggling in her, her career. I remember she was, she wasn't meeting expectations. And I remember some of the other leads said like, oh, let's just fire her. Let's get rid of her. And I remember me and her manager, so, so much potential in her. She just didn't know how to do something because it wasn't something that she learned in school or something before. So we sat her down and we said, hey, you know what? And this is the biggest thing I can say as a manager that you should do. If somebody isn't doing something to your expectations, give them the feedback instead of letting them fail. There's so much can be done if you take the time in, in your employees. So I said to her, I was like, hey, you're not doing X, you know, this, this, and this. You need to, these are, this is how you can improve. You need to do these things. And so that one colleague helped her sort of on the design front. And then I helped her on the leadership front and said, like, we see the potential in you. We're going to invest in you. Later, she ended up becoming, you know, one of the top leaders in that company. And now she's like, she's crushing it. She's doing really well. But we could have, like, let her go, you know, in that, you know, in the past when most people would have just said given up. Um, so, you know, I, I would say it's just like, you know, as a, as a leader, it is also making sure you're investing in the time, give people the feedback, give people in a positive way, give them the feedback that is constructive, that is, we have this term at Metal Lab, we say, uh, be kind, not nice. Nice is where it's like, oh, you're fine. And then, you know, they're not doing fine. It's actually telling them like, hey, you know what? You could do X, Y, and Z better, be direct. Tell them that because people need to hear that so that they can improve and so that they can get better. So, um, sorry, I don't know if I, I kind of went around uh, uh, where the question, you know, maybe first started, but did I get that right? Yeah, I think you did. And I think you said something that really resonates with me. So um, we had a leader before and I think she kept saying clear is kind. And I think a lot of people really underestimate how important it is to give feedback but then also now there's the question of receiving feedback, right? So, I mean, I, I want you to talk about how do you receive feedback? And it's because sometimes feedback can feel like it's a little bit difficult to handle. So I'm just throwing this in here. Yeah. yeah so maybe talk about that and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, I feel like I get feedback all the time from my team, my metal labbers, if you're watching, I love you all, but... Uh, there are times where they'll, uh, you know, I'll get feedback and there are times where I'll be, I'll be like, rrr, rrr, you know, in my, you know, I'll be like, you know, upset by the feedback. You know, don't feel like you have to process that right in the moment. Sometimes like, thank you for your feedback. And then I'll think about it. And then I'll play out the scenario about, you know, however it was handled in my head. And then, you know, I'll figure out like, okay, how can I get better from this? Or what can we do better? Uh, and uh, yeah, and I, I think it's always just, you know, sometimes it's like, Take the moment to absorb it, process it, reflect, and then figure out what you can, you know, what from that feedback do you find like can help you grow. And I think sometimes it's, you know, we can be so quick to react to the feedback and sometimes it can hurt your feelings. I think before you go there, just process it and then, you know, then think about it and then take what you want from that feedback. So. Yeah. Okay. I love that last part, what you said, take what you want from that feedback and find what is really useful for you. Because I think sometimes we can tend to think about that as long as you're being given feedback, then it's kind of something that you need to take. And then you keep changing so much about how you do things. And it's really important to be able to just make that distinction. So I'm going to ask some questions from the audience. We have a question from Sally and she's asking, have you faced imposter syndrome before and how did you deal with it? all the time every day i deal with imposter syndrome uh i will say that 
I think a lot, and I, you know, when I talk to a lot of um, friends and and colleagues, they all deal with it. You know, I, I get to work with some of the most brilliant, talented designers, founders, people in the industry, and I'll be in a room and I'll be like, wow, like these people are so smart. And well, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, I'll tell you, I feel that all the time. And how do I deal with it? Sometimes I just, and I don't know if this is great advice. I kind of try to just push that to the side and I just try to be me. I really just try, I don't try, don't try to be anybody else, be yourself. Uh, because that's when you're going to be most comfortable. That's when you're going to feel like an imposter is when you're trying to be somebody besides yourself. And I always have to remember that. So, All right. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Sally. So another question from, uh, we have a question from John Adab. What would you say are the things men are oblivious about that if done or corrected would help give more power or honor to women in the workplace wow that's a wow, wow. that's a good one. wow thanks for that question uh, i would say i had this you know one colleague who is brilliant super super brilliant uh fellow um that we work and a lot of people disliked it because in the room he would talk over other people he would give his opinion first he would take up a lot of room in the conversation and I think sometimes, you know, men, not maybe not just men, but it's what you're oblivious to is make sure you make space for other people. Yeah. You know, make sure that the, the other people can have um, a voice, you know, in the room so that if, uh, you know, you heard, let's say you're in a room of like, you know, five people and let's say you and somebody else has mostly dominated the conversation. That's probably not a good thing. You should probably take a step back and be like, oh, to one of the other people. What is your point of view? Like, what do you think? And actually listen to them, listen to what they have to say. A lot of times people are jumping in just to give their next point of view. They're not actually listening to what the other person has to say because they just want to get their point out of you. Sometimes it's just like, you know, make sure you're making that space for other people and giving them um, a, a point of view. And also it's just, you know, don't jump to conclusions. I would say a lot of times, maybe sometimes something is going on with somebody and you have no idea you know, what, what is going on in that context or situation, don't jump to a conclusion, listen, understand, get awareness of the context, what is going on. And then, you know, you go from there uh, before, you know, jumping to some conclusion. So, yeah. Okay. I think I put myself back there because you were talking about uh, don't just respond as people are saying. And I was like, I know, right? And then I realized I was about to do that as well. So we have a question from Gabrielle. Work-life balance is a challenge for everyone. Are there any specific initiatives companies can implement to support working moms and caregivers of all genders? And I think you could talk about this from your perspective, from working uh, in different organizations. What are some of the things you've seen work? Yeah, uh, I'm going to just say, I actually don't know if work-life balance is a true statement. I, I, you know, I think it's really hard work-life balance uh, with today. We're, we are so inundated by digital. Uh, and <clears throat> so specific initiatives you can implement for working and, you know, mothers uh, and genders initiatives. You know, I would say, <clears throat> oh, this is a tough one. Um, number one, I, I would say is, well, besides creating, creating a community and support and also making sure that um, trying to create, you know, healthy work hours, you know, is, is, you know, making sure you're understanding like, Hey, sometimes people have to go pick up their kids at the end of the day or drop off. So try not to schedule meetings, you know, at the end of the day. So for us, you know, we try to schedule meetings, you know, in the more core hours of the day so that people can, you know, make it home in time to have a dinner with their family. So just think about other people's time uh, and making sure that you, you are sensitive, you know, to that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times now where I try to turn off, you know, because Slack, you know, while it's a great tool, it's also like can invade your life. As uh, as for myself, I turn off Slack from certain hours so that I can make sure I have time for my family and uh, and I'm not just constantly working because it's so easy to constantly work in this digital age. I, I recommend to anybody is turn off from certain hours when you aren't supposed to be working so that you can dedicate and focus and time to your personal, you know, to your personal health and also to your, to your family and life. I think if you're always on, you're going to burn out. 
And I have burnt out many times in my careers where I was just like, I, I was constantly working. Plus I was, you know, trying to be a mom and well, and, you know, I'd be up until like two o'clock in the morning, you know, I'd address, you know, my baby would go to sleep and then I'd work after that. And then I'd be exhausted. I think it's, you know, try to make sure you're getting that sleep, make, you know, so before I used to stay up and watch Netflix, uh, you know, late into the evening. Now I, you know, we go to bed, uh, my partner and I, we go to bed pretty early. Like after my son goes to sleep, you know, we're in bed by nine. I might stay up a little bit later, but the reason why I do that is if I stay up and, you know, just, you know, either doom scroll, doom scroll, you know, on uh, Instagram or whatever, or, uh, or we're just watching TV. It's just, I, you know, sleep is so much better, you know, like making this, you know, you, you feel so much more better when you, uh, you know, take time to do healthier things in your life. Right. Um, that's really insightful, I think. And uh, we're getting to the top of the hour. So I believe we're three minutes to. So I'm going to ask one last question from the audience. So this question is from Pili. And she's asking, is there a one size fits all approach? To pushing for equality at the workplace? Oh, I'm going to answer there's not a one size fit all approach for pushing equality at the workplace. We need to push more equality in the workplace in general. I think at um, every every you know company has to adapt based to based on the employees that they have, based on their context, based off of all the dynamics. <clears throat> I think it's making sure that you understand you know, the employees and the, the people that are actually working there, what are their needs? How can you support them? Uh, how do you make sure that you're giving them the tools to be successful? So whether it's making sure you're giving them the, you know, the right uh, working conditions, the right, um, you know, digital tools, the right benefits, I think benefits also are important in an organization, the right training, the right, uh, you know, making sure that you have, I mentioned earlier, like growth and performance, so people can grow learning and development. Those things are the things that companies should make sure that they're working on to create, and then hiring practices, making sure you're creating uh, inclusive hiring practices. Those are the things that you can do uh, to make sure that you know, you're creating a better workforce. It's not just one solution. It's gonna be a bunch of solutions and it's gonna be constant work, not only from the leadership team, but from the employees all in general into creating better work you know, places for everybody. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that, Jonah. I'm going to ask you one last question. So essentially, what's one piece of advice? You can say something you've experienced before or just something that you would want to tell the audience today that you feel is really insightful or could really help them to get better in their career, learn how to navigate the workplace as women better. Just one piece of advice. One piece of advice. Um, uh, I know things can feel tough. Uh, there's so many times where I knew I wanted to give up or I would get down on myself. Um, number one is support each other uh, and make sure you support yourself in terms of making sure that you are taking care of yourself and your sort of um, in, in your career journey, but also you're supporting others. There's so many times um, I wouldn't be where I am without the support of uh, colleagues and friends uh, and throughout my career and people who believed in me. So it's believe in somebody else. Uh, I'm sure that they will appreciate it and they will pass it on uh, as they're going throughout their career. Oh, wow. Thank you so, so, so much, Jonah. And thank you so much to everyone in the audience today. We have really, really loved interacting with you throughout this session. Thank you so much, Jonah, for making time to be here for this session. We are thank looking forward to potentially doing this in the future. And yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This was a fun conversation. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.